Good, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. I'm glad everyone was able to make it into the snow this morning, and nobody has uh, died of a heart attack watching the Vikings last night. I know I, I got pretty close myself. But I uh, wanted to just uh, briefly mention a study, research study that we have that we're now enrolling in, the HeartFID study, which uh, is actually a test of an uh, injectable iron product. There have been some studies suggesting that although uh, anemia is very common in heart failure patients, oral iron doesn't work very well, but IV iron has been shown to improve exercise capacity. So this is a randomized placebo-controlled trial, EF less than 35%, symptoms, um, anemia with a low iron, and if you plan VAT or transplant, uh, you're not eligible. Um, Stephanie is our uh, current research nurse, but those of you that know Stephanie know that she will be out having a baby any minute. Um, so Sarah Dennis is also, maybe not any minute, but soon. So uh, Sarah Dennis is also a research coordinator, otherwise you're certainly ha uh, welcome to contact me. Uh, but we're hoping to uh, find a number of patients to enroll in this study, and I will stop there and turn the mic over to one of my colleagues. Dusty, you guys hear me? Is my, the mic on too? Okay. So uh, I'm stepping in to give a talk about some unusual cases. I was dragged in by some friends to talk about some of the unusual cases we've done and um, how we approach things. And one of the things I want to make a comment on is um, that th that's one of the environments that we have here where a lot of other places who are in non-university settings don't have the same level of uh, let's push this, let's try this, let's see if uh, we can advance the field. Um, but we have that here, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad to be part of it. So I'm going to dive right in and, and talk about a, an unusual case. Some of you have taken care of this uh, gentleman. He's been in our system for a while now, 25-year-old male, history of substance abuse, IBDA, and uh, had a tricuspid endocarditis for S MSSA in 2014. Previously, uh, it was done here by uh, Lewis, and um, actually did okay. Was very a, was a very difficult patient to deal with, as some of these um, substance abuse people are. In 2016 of January, he had recurrent MSSA with a tri with now on his tricuspid valve, and um, I didn't want surgery, wanted conservative management. Now I met with him at that point, and for the first time, it was. Uh, um, he was a very, very difficult patient, very intelligent, very sharp. Um, and I, what I found out at the time was that he had a history of actually running his own business and was very successful. But uh, within the past three or four years prior to us being involved with him, uh, he lost his mother suddenly. And so that kind of led him down this kind of unfortunate spir spiral of, of uh, substance use. Um, at the time, did not want surgery, but I talked to him about um, an unusual or different approach to him um, because people who have prosthetic valve endocarditis is in recurrent. Um, they're high, besides the high recidivism, uh, when we put in another prosthetic valve, uh, as many of you guys know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, material that's around that has the potential for bacteria to stick to it. And so what other options might we have that and I had a long conversation with him about that at that time in January. Well, fast forward a few months later. In July, he came out in profound shock with bacteremia, shock liver, renal failure, and blue lips. Uh, went up to the, the ICU service. And here are the two echoes from that time. You can see he's got a prosthetic valve here. You can see the posts here. And on this echo, you can also see the uh, vegetation that's near obstructing his valve. And here's a color flow Doppler, TEE, done. So is he a surgical candidate? Shark liver, acute renal failure, pain in the neck, patient to deal with, rehab's going to be a problem. Recurrence? That's what I thought. Um, and actually, he was dying at, at that moment. He 
basically came in and took out a check and was buying. Um, the interesting thing, which I found a little surprising, is when I walked into the room prior to him even being intubated, and, and he was blue. He remembered me and, um, and remembered the conversation that we had had um, six months earlier. So that was a little bit of a surprise, because clearly this guy's very intelligent. So he understands everything. He just was uh, not, not uh, in a good place. So now what? Of course, we have ECMO. We can save him. You know, this is going to be the new thing. You know, nobody, you know the, the old saying is nobody dies uh, before you're on dialysis. That's, this is going to be the new, the new dialysis. Nobody dies before you're on dialysis. Now, a few days later, we've got, oops, oh, I went all the way back to the beginning. Let's try that again. Let's go back here. Hit the wrong button. So the good, shock liver is resolving, he's starting to trickle urine, acidosis is corrected. All right, we're all excited about that, that's good. The bad, his tricuspid valve is not clotted. So there is no flow through his tricuspid valve. So he is not moving any blood through his heart. And he's still bacteremic, still MSSA. Um, and it gets worse. His arms or legs are black and ischemic and will need bilateral forearm amputations, as well as DKA and AKA. Should we even do anything? I was ready to walk away. I'm, I'm very serious. Um, but of course, we, we have to, you know, we discuss this with the family, what are our options, and you know, we just think this is, this is futility. And that was the, uh, the direction that, that most of us were going through. You know. You're going to do uh, an extreme operation on a person who's not going to have four quarter amputations, uh, and a person who already has mental uh, challenges because of stress and history of substance use. And this guy, you do this, he wakes up with this, he's going to jump off a bridge. So that was the, the kind of the guys, uh, the approach that we were doing with this family. But what they shared with me was that his best friend was in the Gulf War, had three amputations after an IED. And he actually went down there to help him rehab. Uh, so he knew all about the rehabilitative process and how to recover from a multiple amputation. So that was a piece of data that I don't know that I, I mean, nobody I know has that kind of experience. And so they were pressing us that, you know, he knows that, he'll do it, you know, we know what he's like. And we're still thinking, this is nuts. So they begged us to help. And they had swore that he'd been clean for six months, family and girlfriend. And he lives with his girlfriend. And apparently he was clean prior to that last bout of endocarditis of his prosthetic valve, but that had, he had gotten that at some point just prior to that and had been clean. So that was my feeling. Now what? Well. Um, Lisa Kirkland, who is the primary, and um, him um, basically really wanted us to do it, so we did it. I took him to the OR, and this is what I pulled out of this tri. This is still a tricuspid valve, but what I didn't, we don't, what I don't show. So this is the old. This is this is a two-year-old valve, which is worn to crap. But you can see some vegetation here on the leaflet that's all scarred in. Uh, but what I didn't show uh, was there were more veggies that were sitting on top of this thing that really was totally obstructing the uh, the lumen, so you could not, uh, you know, so there's no flow. And as you can imagine, there is a sewing ring, and there is a lot of material here that bacteria can stick onto because it's just not 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 normal. So this is what I what it looks like in the operating room after I'm done. So any idea what I did? I'm going to tell you, there's no struts in there. Any idea? It's clearly not a mechanical valve. You see, it looks like there's something there that leaflet. There's mild residual TR. That's how it's called. See the interrupt. No ideas. Okay, that's okay. This is out of the box. It's a little crazy. So <clears throat> let me rewind a little bit and say there is um, there's a lot of uh, discussions about tissue regeneration and um, different uh, tissue constructs, particular extracellular matrices, uh, for the use for different parts of the body, burns and whatnot. And 
um, there's a guy named Rob Matheny who started a company who uh, has, he's a, actually a trained cardiac surgeon who has gone into the, his research was mostly about uh, biomaterials. And um, they did some work uh, in this particular study. This was published in Circulation. Uh, they took pigs that gave them um, uh, LV infarcts, and they used an extracellular matrix that was based on a bladder. So they basically decellularized some bladder and placed it in there, sewed it into the infarct, and then showed over time that there was some ingrowth of actually myocardium into the uh, pig muscle. This was uh, reproduced with a different uh, construct called the jejunal, uh, jejunal extra ma extracellular matrix on the right side. And it was actually done in orthopedics as well, where they did, uh, they took a bunch of dogs, cut out the, uh, the um, Achilles tendon, sewed it in, and, um, and it came back and became Achilles tendon over the span of about six months. So then they said, well, you know, if it works, let's try other things too. And they did this in an, in an ovine model uh, where they put in the tricuspid valve. And they essentially cut out the tricuspid valve, manu just kind of created another one, and then put it back in into the tricuspid valve and cheek. And this is, I don't know if it projects very well, this is what it looks like when you first put it in. They sewed it in, and they tack it down in various places. It's basically a tube valve, or a flapper valve, if you guys know anything about a flapper valve. Uh, I'll show you what it looks like. And then sew it in. <clears throat> and then afterwards, this is a three and nine months, what it looks like on the sheep. So this is a three months, this is a nine months. And you can see that it's actually formed a somewhat trileaflet tissue valve that works. So I was at a dinner meeting <clears throat> in, um, it was actually ISHLT in Prague. I was having dinner with a good friend of mine named Viv Rao, who was the chief at uh, Toronto General. And he had done one of these on a patient with recurrent endocarditis. And, um, and it was an aha moment, I guess, because I've known Rob, I've known about this study, because we were using some of uh, his matrices for other parts. We do use it for pericardial closures. We do use it for uh, uh, ASDs and whatnot. And I also use it uh, to close the pericardium on our bad patients, because it makes it easier for us to dig out. And so Viv was telling me about that he had done one. And I was like, wow, this is fascinating. So we kind of talked more about it, did some more research on it. Um, and this, so, so we did another one. So with it, this is the extracellular matrix, and we essentially just uh, cut it, flip it in half, make it double layer, because this, this is only two plies, and we needed a four ply. Sew it over a, uh, a uh, valve, I'm sorry, a uh, syringe, and then I sew it in. And this is what it looks like when I was done with him. So if you can see, this is the IVC, this is the cannula, this is the IVC, this is the SVC, the orders over here. <clears throat> this, the, the suction is into the coronary sinus. This is the Padesian valve. And here's a tricuspid valve. So it looks like this is a septal leaflet, anterior posterior leaflet. And we tack these together, and that's it. <clears throat> so how do you do? Yeah, so this was Viv who uh, introduced me to this. And uh, we wrote this paper up, uh, well, this was published in JTCVS a few years ago. This was my second case. Our first case that I did here was a woman of actually Richard Bayes, who was clean for several months. Uh, we did this procedure on it. She looked great for the first uh, month or two, of course, in, actually in the hospital <clears throat> while she was recovering. <clears throat> excuse me. She was taking her pills, crushing them up, and then injecting them. So uh, her valve actually broke down about two months later. I don't know if it was technical because I screwed it up or just because she was shooting up again that she died. We, we, we let her die. This guy, um, we'll see. So we did a bunch of them, uh, and the results looked pretty reasonable early on, but there's not a whole lot of long-term data. This is him one year afterwards, so this is the summer, and this is his valve which still seems, this is a transthoracic echo, obviously, still functioning, and has, still has mild PR, but it looks like it's at least keeping itself durable. And the funny thing is, or actually the funny thing is, the epilogue on him was um, he got his four-quarter amputation, and I saw him in clinic in a wheelchair uh, about six weeks after uh, the, the original discharge, and um, he was very grateful. I, he was not angry. Give me a big hug, and, um, and we sent him on his way. I, how I ended up 
following up with him because he kind of lost the follow-up. We had another follow-up. He didn't show up. I thought he died. I didn't know. But I was just uh, over the summer getting my own blood drawn out, sitting in the, getting in the lab. And this guy, in out of the corner of my eye, gets up, walks over to me, and it's him. He's got titanium legs, titanium arms. Just good. came up, walked up to me, and gave me a big hug. And he said, and his life is good. And uh, so I've seen him in clinic since then. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. I, I don't know that he's cured, but in terms of his, uh, his uh, other issues. But at least a year follow-up with this, uh, he's a, it's a surprisingly... Uh, good result thus far. And we'll see how, how durable this is. Uh, there is some data on some of these that were taken out a year or two years later by that same group in Toronto uh, that showed some level of, of, of uh, transformation of the uh, extracellular matrix, but it's not complete like this is, that this is a, um, on a tricuspid valve. Uh, this, is, this tissue is also used in pediatrics. One of my Previous students, Patrick McConnell, who's at Nationwide Children, is doing that, and he's been publishing on that. And um, there's some very good durability with uh, that this particular uh, approach in children as well, reconstructing valves. So this is something to kind of think about as we're moving forward. Um, uh, decellularized matrices have made a lot of noise uh, probably about six or seven years ago uh, when um, people have started decellularizing hearts and other things uh, as a basis for uh, myocardial recovery, uh, not myocardial, but just uh, regenerative medicine, with the idea that uh, perhaps the scaffolding, which is the extracellular matrix, is just as important as the stem cells. Uh, and, and I think that that's a very important concept. We've, we find stem cells to be very sexy, and um, it generates uh, a lot of interest because you say, well, stem cells are sort of potent. They can, they can convert into anything. But there's something about the local scaffolding that tells the stem cell what it's supposed to go and become. And I think working with those two together are going to be much more important in moving uh, the developmental field forward. We did a bunch of stem cell work when I was at Ohio State. We did some transplants um, of stem cells into our bad, into a bad sheep animals uh, model. And we had to put in billion, a billion cells a billion cells, and we had a 0.02% in graphene weight, and we were really excited about that. Well, that's, that's, that's not excitement. That's shotgun. I mean, we can probably get that by luck. Uh, so the idea of, 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 of putting these two uh, ideas, uh, two concepts together, is something that has got some more traction as people are developing in vitro scaffoldings and then putting stem cells together and then trying to come up with... Uh, uh, some um, some merged form of that. So I'm going to shift and do something totally different uh, with a different case, which is a case that was a congenital, very complex congenital case. So 30-year-old black male, complex cyanidic congenital disease, dexter position, single right ventricle, both great vessels arriving from a single ventricle, so we've got a double outlet right ventricle. The aorta is anterior and to the left. Congenital pulmonary stenosis, which is actually good, so it protected the pulmonary vascular resistance from hypertension. But at the same time, that's why he was still alive, because he had a single ventricle, but it was kind of a controlled shunt. You're following me. I'll show a little bit of a cartoon of this, because this is really hard to, just by describing, you know, like, what the blank is this. But common AV valve, so one atrium, one ventricle, technically is a tricuspid valve, because he has left-sided atresia, there's no mitral valve. That's was AV valve replacement with a 32 millimeter St. Jude before my time. Had a right thoracotomy for biventricular pacing. Uh, also had an IVC interruption with an as discontinuation to the left side SVC and a right side SVC. And uh, common atrium, so all the veins come together. So you, you sort of get at this one chamber, a lot of stuff coming to it. So this is what it looks like. Um, so you have a person whose heart's pointing to the right. There's essentially one atrial chamber, one ventricular chamber. This is the, supposed to be the septum that separates the left and the right side. Uh, so you see the left side had the aorta on it, the right side with the pulmonary valve on it. But it's only one chamber, one chamber. Uh, the IVC comes up and stops. And then there's an azygous that comes up and around, comes down to the left-sided SVC, drains here. Then there's a right-sided SVC, drains here. Again, one common chamber. Pulmonary veins return from the lungs back into the single chamber, so it all mixes. So you have bright red blood here, mixes, goes through this AV valve, and, and the liver drains on this side. 
and then it goes through one chamber that ejects both to the lungs and to the aorta. But he was actually born with congenital pulmonary stenosis, so it restricted the flow into his lungs, which is actually good. Everybody follow? Did he have a common atrium or two atria? Common atrium. One big atrium. Okay? So, this is what he's got. Oh, yeah, so this is the, these are the right heart cath numbers. Uh, and I'll explain how we do the right heart cath on this one because it's really interesting. So uh, IBC, 44% SATs, uh, and at the time, um, uh, so then all we can do from a right heart cath is actually get the IBC, uh, and they come to the left side, come down on the SVC, and then into the atrial chamber, the common atrial chamber, because you can't cross this valve. You'll, you'll lock it. So to get the PA pressures, you have to come up the arterial side, measure this because you have PA fat there, aortic pressure is 95 over 66, come into the ventricular chamber, single common chamber, Pressure's there, 95 over 11, 86% set, and then go backwards and then up the PA. That's the only way you can cast them to get the PA pressures, which were actually normal, surprisingly, when we cast them. This was, uh, again, he has congenital pulmonary stenosis, so it's protecting it. Now, this is before he crashed and burned. So this is, this is his baseline, I'm doing great. All right, 30-year-old. Uh, common atrial pressure was 16 at the time, 85% set, makes 89% of the right SVC. So you can see all the numbers. It sort of makes sense, you know, like, crazy, but the guy's 30 years old. Well, he, this was when he was probably a little younger. But now he comes in, class 4 heart failure, IV inotropes, neceratide, and remaining class 4, we almost officially hepatic congestion with cystitis, severe peripheral edema, CVP is now 34. Now what are we going to do with this guy? We, we ran this by a bunch of congenital people, and they just looked at us and went, hmm. And we had, this is when I was at Ohio State, we had a big congenital program down at Nationwide Children's Hospital. We uh, ran this by uh, CHOP, uh, Texas Children's, and everybody said, we don't have a, we don't have a good op option for it. So we had to come up with our own option. So what are our options? I'm going to go through this slowly because they, they don't make a whole lot of sense to people like us who don't think about congenitals all the time. Option one. Single bed, technically an R bed, so the apex of that right ventricle to the ascending aorta. So everything stays mixed like it is. The problem is you've now bypassed the lung, which doesn't work. So to do that, you have to put a central shunt in. So that would be an aorto to PA controlled shunt. To, so you have one bed, control the shunt so you can get blood into the lungs and back. Okay. Our congenital cardiac surgeons suggested and thought about this, because this is how they think. All right. It's good. Bivet. There's two options for bivet. I'll go through one. I'll go through both of them. Common atrium, so I'm going to leave the atrium by itself. They have common atrium. You have both venous return and pulmonary return going to the same thing. It's that mixing, right? So you put two cannulas in there, or you put a cannula in the one cannula there to the PA. <laughs> And then another one where you go into the ventricle, which is still the same blood, going to the AO. And then you adjust the VAD to control the flow. So you turn down one, speed up the other. Turn down to balance the blood flow through the lung. That was option two. Option three. You baffle the common atrium to a separate systemic venous and pulmonary artery turns. This is my idea. This is the, I, I'm, I'm smoking some bad stuff, you know. <laughs> so I would basically uh, baffle the common atrium to separate systemic venous and pulmonary artery turns. So I essentially would baffle the pulmonary veins, so I would, which is the oxygenated blood, through the common valve, okay, and then I do an LVET. But then all the pulmonary, all the regular body, uh, systemic venous return goes back into a blind ending pouch. Goes nowhere. Put a cannula there, and then go to the, the uh, PA. So I have, so I would create two separate circuits by what he had. Following me? Yes? No? Yes? Okay. 
<laughs> so we, we, we talked about this quite a bit. Ben, before you go on, I just, could you um, apply sampling or redirecting the feature that effectively has a huge issue? Could, would a, a similar just parsing technique to box and play be appropriate? <laughs> I presented this case at STS meeting. Jack Copeland was in the, the audience. I said, Jack, what do you think? What about a total? No chance. Because, yeah, there's no chance because we have two, you have, you have Venus return coming from three different, actually four different channels. So you have to think about the atrium. If you look at the atrium, there's four different Venus returns on the ends, north, south, north, south on the right and left side, and then the central part is the pulmonary is the pulmonary venous return which is in the middle so you, it, there's no way he could think of to come up with a baffling system where you could actually sew in because you need a right and a left uh, and there was no way to do that in his mind what a lot of people may not realize is a total total artificial heart leaves that it is dependent on the atria yeah, leaves you need the atria. Two atria it's really a ventriculectomy correct is what it ends up being so you actually could have done a stenting, shunt, you know, atrial baffle shunt to do that as well. But, um, but you know, most adult people don't think of um, atrial baffles and shunts. Um, that was the other option. <laughs> yeah, I presented at the SDS meeting went for this case, and people were like, you're, you're nuts. So this is him. You can see ascites. Peripheral edema. You can see the, uh, the all the edema in the lower extremities uh, on this poor guy. So, what do we do? First, I cannulated his femoral artery to go on bypass down here. I cannulated the right SVC. Cannulated the left SVC. This one and also the IVC. So I cannulated the venous return here, here, and here and arterial here. And then I went through his left chest, because again, this, is, this heart's pointing to the right now. So I went from this side so I can look inside. Uh, yeah, I baffled the pulmonary veins and through this. I'll, I'll show what this all does. I baffled the pulmonary veins so the venous returns through this valve here uh, into a common ventricle. I oversold this pulmonary valve. I probably didn't need to, but I did just so that I totally separated the two circulations. He also had an ASD. I closed that too. I don't, I don't even remember what the ASD was, to be honest with you, and all this nonsense. So that's essentially what I did. It looks simple. And oversaw the valve. And I'll show you. So this is a picture intraoperatively. Again, left chest, heads to the right, legs to the left. This is the venous cannula to the right-sided SVC. This is the venous cannula to the left-sided SVC. Uh, this is the uh, this is in the common atrium right now, and this is the mechanical valve which is exposed. All right. And um, I'm going to apologize for the quality. This was you know days of VCRs, so this was actually done on tape. Uh, hopefully, you can see some of it. So um, um, you're looking inside. There's the mechanical valve there. I'm ex exposing it to you. Um, down here, which I will show you, is where you'll see the pulmonary veins come in. I don't know if you can see that. There's two right there. And you know, the reason you, you wear a head cam and, and I'm shaking, not because I drink coffee, but it's just they just shake. So these are the pulmonary veins. And here's an, actually the ASD over here where there's actually venous return coming back in from the left side. Um, and so this is me sewing the atrial baffle in. So uh, I'm basically taking this piece of pericardium and sewing it along this edge. And I will kind of point it out in a second, and my assistants will recognize I have my special sewing forceps, which they had for me there too. And so I'm going to put this baffle down to kind of channel the pulmonary veins up into this area here. So I'm putting the baffle on the top, and then I'm going to flip it up and show you the, the bottom of it real quick. So I get the baffles half in, and uh, these are the pulmonary veins down here. And then I'm drawing with my forceps. This is where I'm going to put the, the rest of the baffle going around all pulmonary, pulmonary veins. So I'm basically channeling the pulmonary venous return into the common AV valve into the left ventricle. That make sense? So that's another patch. So there's two patches I'm actually putting down. 
and then I sew the patches together because I can do it once very easily. Anyway. So there's the bottom patch, and then I, I put them together. So that's that's what the patch kind of looks like when I'm done. I'm just tacking it up together. So now I have the pulmonary venous return going into a blind pouch. It goes nowhere, right? So then, so this is what. So again, this is the this is the kind of how it's filleted open. There's the IVC SVCs are up here, pulmonary veins are here, and then I put a patch there and around the bottom. Looks simpler this way, closer than that. If you describe it, it this sound this looks easier than it sounds, right? And so then I got to put the vads in. So this is the apex of the heart. I actually dissected it all out, flipped it up towards me. So I'm pulling at the apex right now, put a hole in it, stick a sucker in there, and then I'm going to throw some stitches on the apex. This is a Thortec cannula, uh, which is an external bivad, which I'll show you in a moment. So this is the cannula that I sew into, and then we stick that into the apex of the left ventricle so it drains out. And then um, now here's the uh, aorta and here's the PA. It looks a little small, but that's that's the PA. So I open it up and I oversewed the valve, which I like I said I didn't need to. And then um, you'll see I throw the grafts down there in a moment. This is actually oversewed. So here's a here's a graft to the outflow graft for the pulmonary artery. So I'm throwing that into the small ish. PA down here. And then over here is the aorta, which I'll also sew in another graph too. So now I have the pulmonary graft in over here. And then I have a side binding of the Lamole clamp down here. And this is the aorta. That's clamped. You don't really see it. It's partially clamped. Heart's beating the whole time. I didn't arrest this heart. And, uh, and then I sew the uh, outflow graft to the uh, ascending aorta. So, and then I have to put a cannula into that so this blinding tab. So this is that big atriotomy. I put a, an incision on the side hole and I put a big cannula through here and then close this over the top. And this cannula that you'll see is uh, the venous, which is right here, is the venous cannula, which will drain the blind ended uh, bad pump. Um, in the right side. So that's it. And then I just close the atrium and I'm done. It took me 13 hours to do this operation. Uh, so this is what it looks like sort of at the end. I've got a baffle that comes across here. I've got a cannula, which is sort of the last thing that I put in. This is a blind ending pouch. So that venous return just comes into the blind pouch, comes through here, comes out into the PA, which is oversewn pulmonary artery. And then all the oxygenated blood comes through this baffle, through this common chamber up here to the ascending order, right? And that's what it looks like with the arrows. So venous return coming through, that out, comes back in from the lungs. Now, now I've totally separated the circulation, so his, uh, his oxygenation is normal. And that was it. 400 minutes of bypass time, no cross claim. I have like 10 hours of video. It's crazy. But it's all that kind of crappy VCR stuff. But it is what it is. So this is what his chest x-ray looks like. So there's the mechanical valve. There's the cannula going on the right side. This is the LV cannula. You don't see the, uh, the, the other uh, alpha graph. So you can sort of see them down here. And I have a little short uh, you know, contrast going up in that as it gets coming around the SVC. And then basically down into this cannula as it goes into the, all this other uh, stuff. So, so we could balance him. R bed five liters a minute, L bed six to six and a half liters. Long post recovery. I think he was in the hospital four months because he was discharged in March, and we did him in October. So about four four months of inpatient rehab and whatnot, pulmonary transfusion. Um, and this is him with my coordinator. Uh, before he was discharged. Now, he did very well. But the session went home, and um, and then we brought him back in for his transplant. Elective 1A, he converted from 2 and a half, and everything's perfect. Everything was perfect. 
I mean, this guy actually had normal blood gases after all this, normal physiology. He was stone cold freaking normal. But he died at 3 o'clock in the morning with a massive CVA. And um, so this was his, his CT scan. We got a post on him. And he had a ruptured very aneurysm. Um, and this is, this is all the description of all the stuff that we have, common atrium, special splatin, valuvaz, yada, 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 yada. But Kurt and I had taken care of this guy for a while. And um, what we found out, which we didn't know, was that uh, apparently there is a bunch of congenital disorders that may be at risk for intracranial hemorrhage because it was no press. That's how they developed together. So they had these abnormal, you know, the congenital people know this, but, you know, I, 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 me not living in the congenital world very much, not uh, even realize this. So now we screen people with congenital disease for cerebral artery aneurysms because this guy, um, was was just a great guy, great family, touched everybody. Um, this is one of my different discussion, but this is one of the reasons I stopped going to church. But um, anyway, so it was a very challenging case, different way of approaching things. And um, so I thought I'd just present some kind of cool cases and talk about them. Questions? Man, that was fantastic and very interesting cases. My, my question to you is, it's unfortunate that he never, never came to transplant, but um, if he would have come to transplant, how could you reconstruct his venous return in order to make it happen? So there were two ways we were approaching this. Um, you actually can, and it's very well described, bring the uh, you can baffle the left-sided system to the right. And how you do that is take, um, um, create, uh, so, so we have an IVC and SVC in anastomosis, right? That's typically what we do right now. It's supposed to atrial anastomosis, which is the original lower shumway technique. We've gone away from that to a bicable, so an IVC, SVC, as well as the AOPA, left atrial. Now, how, how you do it is you basically put a baffle in from the left SVC and create essentially a coronary sinus, if you would, towards the right, okay? Then you put that into where the liver drains into this baffle. So then that, there's your IVC anastomosis, okay? And your SVC is still the same, okay? Now, posteriorly, that's actually not as difficult because basically they just go around the pulmonary veins with a larger left atrial uh, cup and separate that, those four, four out. The AOPA, they're in the same place. Well, I mean, it's a Lacan maneuver. There, there, I mean, you can just, you know, which is a, which is a pull it from one side to the other. It's a Lacan, it's called a Lacan maneuver. So yeah, we were, we were, we were prepared. That description, when you have a left-sided SVC, which we do see times, is, a, is first described by Don Doty. So it's, it's a known maneuver. Thank you, everybody, very much. Um, please stop by and thank our sponsors for this week. That's Actillion and Novartis as you leave. And one last announcement. We've, um, we have postcards out there. That we have the national, the first um, National Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day event that's going to be coming up. It's a, um, public, a general public-oriented event for patients and potential patients for heart valve disease. So please pick up some postcards if um, you think you might have some patients that would be interested in attending. It's a free event. Thank you very much. Have a great week.